I'm Gloria Roba. I am a youth policy analyst. I am a community worker. Uh, I am currently also running an NGO. I am so many things. I'm a mother. <laughs> um, basically, what I love to do and what I'm currently doing is I'm engaging in different spaces with the community on uh, my capacity and uh, youth advocacy as well as um, politics. I'm also into politics, I'm a politician. Wow, I have a very interesting background. I come from a family of four siblings. Actually, we are four girls. We were all raised by my father. He was a single father back in the 90s, which was really like a big thing. So I think as far back as I can remember, I've always been a public speaker. I've always been the person that will speak up for the person who does not seem to have a voice. Um, I recall in nursery school, I loved to entertain people. I loved to sing. In primary school, the same. I was in State House Primary and I loved to entertain people, poems, words. Uh, I went to St. George's uh, Secondary School, which is also, it, it, it actually at that time used to really push on like uh, co curricular activities, drama. Uh, I was the entertainment prefect, and <laughs> that's why I'm saying when I look back, I'm like, ah, it's, it seems like a natural transition. Um, and I picked up drama, and uh, actually, uh, when I think it was from two, when I really started to realize that I have a talent and I wanted to harness it and it was in public speaking. And those days, I don't know if they still have it, we had like um, public speaking competitions and we would go out and, and I always used to be first. Actually, it was either me or Rama Nyang who ended up also in the media space as a, as a, as a TV anchor and journalist. So when I look back, I'm like, yeah, it kind of made sense where I am now. Um, so of course I transitioned, I had a passion and I still have a passion in um, spaces, uh, design and build, construction and uh, I was, it was so clear that when I was in uh, secondary school I really wanted to go into the architectural space. I wanted to be an architect and I wanted to go and pursue that and um, I remember that um, because at that time my, my sisters, two of my sisters were in university and my dad was kind of, you know, he was a civil servant, so he was kind of overwhelmed with the um, fees and things like that. So he, he, you know, I think the whole fees thing was kind of like, eh, hey, we're Goja, because now that you finished, and I scored very well. I scored really good grades, actually. I got a B from high school. Um, and he was like, you need to wait. So I had a, a gap year. I had one year where I was waiting to see because I didn't want to take up any other course. He had tried to convince me, like, to start something else that was affordable and I was like no I just want to study architecture so I ended up uh, studying architecture uh, uh, neck diploma and uh, after that um, I got an opportunity actually from my first employer I had an internship I went for my internship at the United Nations and then um, my boss had a friend at the my boss at the United Nations had a friend who just bought a building Shan Cinema in Gara and they were turning it into a creative space and, and, and I was just, I think I was in the right uh, place at the right time because uh, it was during like a lunch break. Um, I was talking to my boss and he's like, oh, let me introduce you to this guy. You know, he has just bought a building and since you're, you know, about to finish your internship and uh, you know, maybe this would be like your first big gig and whatever. So I ended up uh, becoming the architectural liaison for that client, for Shan Cinema, and basically the whole project was to refurbish it and turn it into a creative space. So that was my first big gig in, um, you know, right after I finished my education in architecture, it was my first big gig. And I was, uh, I think, six or seven months pregnant. <laughs> so I remember coming out of um, United Nations and then uh, um, going to site. The site was in Gara, the building was full of crap, we couldn't see the floor. For many years it was being used uh, as a sort of dump site um, for all sorts of things, including dead bodies. So it took us, I think, two and a half weeks for us to really clear out the building for us to see the floor. And remember I was pregnant, but I was so excited. I was like, you know, we are going to turn this thing around. And you know, once we cleaned it up and you could see that the terrazzo floor was so beautiful, 
the different elements in it, just the pillars, the design. It's really a beautiful building. So I did that. Then uh, that lasted, I think, um, somewhere between six and eight months. And after we delivered the building, now um, the boss at Sarakasi, the, it was now turned into Sarakasi Dome. So the boss at Sarakasi was like, hey, why don't you just join us? And um, you know, you can work with us, it's been fun. We can give you some work. You can figure out as a program officer, you know, where you want to be, maybe manage the building, things like that. So that's how I got myself into the creative space. So, and while in the creative space, it was interesting because you know, the thing with me is um, when I'm in a space that I love to be in and I'm feeling like, uh, you know, the work is inspiring and it has an impact, I just thrive. So automatically from there, um, there was a project that was coming from the Netherlands. There was a producer who was coming in to put together an African theatre show and they needed a project manager. And of course I volunteered. I was like, oh, I can help, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so they came in, they were doing um, auditions all around Africa, then they brought all these cast members to the dome there. And after the um, three months of them putting together the show, the company in the Netherlands was like, hey, would you like to come work for us in the Netherlands? So somehow you can see, you know, my, my passion in architecture got me to this creative space. And then from there, uh, I got into this gig and they wanted me to um, go around Africa recruiting for them good talent, putting together musical theatre shows. So I entered into that. I was in Amsterdam for around two and a half years. Um, and then, I mean, and I picked up skills in terms of like now production. And actually within that period, I was able to bring back that whole concept of musical theatre show. I came back to Kenya and uh, I went to the Ministry of Tourism and Najib Balala was there actually. And I was like, listen, I work for this company in the, the Netherlands. Um, they produce beautiful uh, productions for theatre and every winter you have more than 10,000 people watching those shows. And I think this would be like a perfect opportunity for us to market Kenya in, in, in Europe, in Belgium, Netherlands and Luxembourg, Benelux. So, I was sent to Kenya Tourism Board. I put together proposals back and forth between the ministry and the Kenya Tourism Board. And uh, they were like, yeah, let's do it. Let's make an, a Kenyan musical theater show and uh, use it to market destination Kenya. So for me, that was my highlight. It was like, oh, wow, okay. You know, Kumbe, we can, <laughs> we can move things and actually have a bigger impact. So that was the beginning of now my, my, my journey um, in Europe. And I say this just because my, my boss in Europe used to say, oh, you're going to be the woman of the world. You're going to travel the world. And he used to, and I used to think, this guy is just telling me that so that I don't ask for a salary increment. <laughs> so, but then looking back, I was like, oh my goodness, he had seen the potential. So we did the show with the Kenya Tourism Board. We launched Najib Balala. That was now my first interaction with politicians, with governments in terms of like now, you know, work that can be done, impact. And I got excited. So in my mind, I kept on saying, in the future, I want to be in government and change things and, and just turn around the creative industry space. You know, and just, I, I, I shelved it in my mind, like, oh, this is good and I want to do more of this. So um, I worked at the data, Facebook data center, managing the, the data center, ensuring that everything is running okay. You know, it's a critical facility, so, no downtime in terms of electricity. You have all these um, engineers, subject matter experts, and what guys who are dealing with the actual now fiber and stuff like that. And um, yeah, that was a good experience. And I can tell you, I was the only woman in that department. In fact, I was supervising 50 plus year old white males. And they found it, it was so interesting for them <laughs> because here I was, young, from Africa, black as you can see. So that was also a good experience. Um, and then after a while, something kept on telling me, you know, we need to go back to what we, we really love to do. I mean, I love to be in construction and then and, and the critical facilities and I'm good at it. I'm really good at it. In fact, when I was at Facebook, I was able to, one of my achievements is, um, I was able to put together um, 
an automated system that manage their assets. It's like an asset management system, but we made it more efficient. So I'm, it's stuff that I'm good at, and it's the technical things that I really like to do. But I think maybe it is the fact that I wasn't home because I was in a foreign country, and there were a lot of dynamics that were playing. And still, I remembered the impact that we had when we had that project in government. And I remembered, you know, I also have a background in social work, actually. So I remember that was my, that's where I really want to be. I mean, if I can do that and this at the same time. So I packed up my things and came back to Kenya. So I came back and everyone asked me, why are you going back? And I used to tell them, because I'm going to join politics. And they were like, what? Who even does that? I'm like, yes, I'm going back to Kenya because I want to join politics. I want to be in that space. I want to be in government, elective or otherwise, but I really want to go back home. So I came back and shut down everything back on the other side. It was a really, I actually destabilized my family. But you know, sometimes you have to do what you have to do because I felt like I have been giving a lot of my time, a lot of my, you know, a lot of me to other people and now I felt like now I need to work on me and this is what I want to do. So I came back um, and it was funny because I came back and the community work that I was doing, it's like we picked up from where we left off, you know, it was like my network's like, oh, we're back, you know, we're doing this, we have that and that's how I ended up again running an NGO. And um, while I was doing that, I was pretty clear in my mind that the path is politics. No one should lie to you at a step number one, step number There's no formula. You just need to find your way into those pieces. So when I came back, my sister happened to be friends with the youth uh, secretary at the office of the deputy president. So she told me, you know what, go see this guy. And then we'll see where that will lead you. Just tell him you want to join politics, nini nini. So I went to the guy's office and he demotivated me like hell. He was like, Oh, you want me to bring you to this camp, you want to work for us, but you've done nothing. Even your social media pages don't have anything to show for it. I can't even take you to anyone within our circles because literally you have no CV. I mean, really, you're not even on TV. So what are, you know, just go do something before you can. He really demotivated me. By the way, that day after that um, meeting with him, it was in town, in Annex. Let me tell you, I came back home. I switched off my phone. I slept. I was like, imagine, <laughs> this was too hard for me. So, but then when I woke up, I thought, actually, I'm SMA. I'm not even on TV. Kwani TV is what? Kwani, I can't go on TV. So I called a friend of mine. Um, she, that time, actually, it's uh, um, Sheila Masinde. She's uh, from Transparency International. She's a director now. So I called her, I was like, eh, Sheila, you know, I know you used to be in media. And, you know, I'm thinking I want to start doing, um, you know, the analysis that I do for consulting, I now want to do it publicly and on TV. So in case you would like get an opportunity, let me know. So after two weeks, Sheila calls me. And, you know, I'm still trying to find my way, my footing into some political spaces. So she calls me, she tells me, hey, tomorrow we have, uh, I've been called for a show at NTV, but um, I can't make it. So I've told the producer, that I'm sending someone, so you better go. That was my first ever, like, political analysis or any analysis publicly. So I was excited, there were a lot of scandals, and uh, I remember this one scandal because it was significant. There was a scandal about um, some foreigners who had been conned, um, allegedly, and it happened at the deputy president's uh, office at Annex. And they were really discussing it. And I was so irritated about it because I thought I was going to go to studio to talk about real issues, you know. So I was like, so what happened? Because of the fact that I'm coming from Europe, I've gotten, you know, I've been exposed to being mistreated as a foreigner, as an African, blah, blah, blah. So I had that feeling of, why are we even giving this thing airtime? So I remember everyone was talking about, oh, you know, they've been conned, nini, nini. And I started shedding light on the people. So I remember it was uh, Olive Barrows on set and I asked Olive, why uh, are we so focused on these people who've been, Kenyans are being conned every day, including in office, government offices. Why are we focused on this? Because they're white, because they're foreigners. But you see, my attitude was like, I've just come back to the country. I'm wondering why are we giving these people special treatment? 
Uh, so I'm like, these foreigners, first of all, why were they in the country? Did they have the proper paperwork? They're talking about doing business. Did they come as tourists? And you know the funny thing? In my rant, for me it was a rant, and I was like, can't we just start loving ourselves? And in that funny rant, the things that I highlighted were now brought to the forefront. On the next day's newspaper, it was splashing all over. Foreigners never had valid work permits, blah, 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 blah. So my sister called me and she's like, Haya, do you know that just from your interview, now you've changed the narrative and things like that. And it was from that interview, I got a very strategic, strategic phone call. Actually, not, I think the next day, I got a phone call from uh, the communications team of uh, the deputy president. And one of the guys was like, oh, let's have lunch. And so I'm like, who are you? And they were like, Lord, let's just have lunch. I think they were trying to figure out who am I, you know, what side of the political divide. So I met this person for lunch. They were asking me questions. I was just, you know, usual, telling them everything. I'm back in the country. Me, uh, you know, we need to be in the next government. We need to change things. And from what I was talking and from the narrative I was giving them, because I started telling them I'm the NGO world, you know, it's time that the people in the slums be recognized and what and what. And apparently, at, as far back as 2019, the deputy president already had his thoughts of the bottom-up economy. So when I was speaking about these people in, in the slums and we need to put them to the table and we need to do this and, you know, I was just ranting and all the ideas that I thought I had that I'm going to, you know, bring into the next government. So this guy told me, what are you doing on so-and-so day, same week? I said, nothing, I'm just, you know, community work, what, what. So they were like, let's meet at this place in Karen. So I went. Then they were like, oh, you need to leave your car. I said, no, I can't leave my car, we need to go. <laughs> they were like, okay, follow me. And that's how I found myself in the deputy president's office. Looking back, at that time I wasn't trading. And what happened to me is that I was thrown into the deep end and uh, because he was trying to tell me, you know, in a nice way and not to discourage me. And I was like, no, I am going to do this. I have these plans and whatever. My campaign is starting. I was just excited. And now finally, when he said, okay, you go, then you tell me how it goes. I started seeing most of the things that he was trying to prepare me for. But of course I vied. Um, it was difficult. It's a patriarchal society. I experienced a lot of violence. I experienced a lot of character development. <laughs> um, the, at one point, um, the leadership of the Kisi team actually wanted to give away my ticket to one of their favorite guys, of course a man. You know, that time we were doing these negotiated democracy things. And, um, and I fought and I fought and I was in every office and I was in the party offices and, and I said, you know, worst case scenario, you people at least owe me a primaries. Let us go to the ballot during primaries. Whoever wins, wins. But this negotiated democracy, because of the fact that the Kisi leadership already had a bias towards a guy who, by the way, came last. I was like, no, let's go. So we went for primaries and um, I came in second. I got 5,587 votes. And um, I think I did well. I think actually, um, I, I, I exceeded expectations. Everyone was kind of like, why would I read in Akura Miyambili? So when I came back with my 5,500 and the winner actually won with about a thousand and a couple of hundreds. So it wasn't so bad. And uh, I took, it was during Easter, it was very, it was an emotional. By the way, anyone who has lost an election can tell you it's heavy. I took some time off. I was getting all sorts of advice. The other side of the divide was trying to get me. I got so many phone calls asking me, come for lunch, come for what? They wanted me to now decamp, like umenyimu a ticket, tunajua ulishinda. Yeah, so I found other ways to be useful. Women chatter, I've been going around selling what the promise of William Ruto to the women, um, the youth. Um, of course, I'm still, and I'm even better at my advocacy now in terms of public analysis of things. So I've, it's actually been a blessing in disguise. And, um, and I'm, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that um, this is not the end of me in politics. I'm going to be in these active spaces. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to play a, a, magnif a magnificent role in uh, parliament. So um, I'm very certain of, of my future in terms of politics and I'm actually excited about it. The advice that I can give um, 
myself. Is it myself? Like 20 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> so that it's like I'm advising the youth, but also to myself. Uh, I would say, follow your instincts. Because every single time that I had to make a life-changing decision, I had a lot of people uh, around me, my family, you know, people of authority trying to push me a certain direction. But because of the fact that they say I'm stubborn, but really it's following my instincts, I ended up you know, in a certain direction. And all those things have brought me to this point. Like when I wanted to leave the country the first time, everybody was telling me, you can't, your child is so young, blah, 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 blah. Why can't they give you that job here? But I went against uh, all that advice and it actually opened doors in the future. In terms of politics, everyone was like, you're crazy. You're a senior manager at Facebook and you want to leave that job and go back to a third world country. And I literally, something was just telling me, this is the right thing went against all those people trying to make you follow the conventional and my gut feeling was go back home join politics i came back i joined politics the same thing with vying a lot of people are saying you don't need to vie you know just be active and then you'll be nominated and i was like no but you know we need to get elected so <laughs> how do we get elected if we just keep saying we'll be active we'll be nominated so i vied i pushed of course i would have wished i got the ticket but i didn't i lost so I feel like one of the advice for sure, follow your gut, follow your instincts, because somewhere in there, there's, there's that voice that knows where you need to be. And then the second advice is, uh, if at first you don't succeed, try and try and try and try again. And that, that's the same for, it's not just academics, it's not just um, career, it's even family, you know? I, I've been married before, it didn't work out. <laughs> I've been married again, you know. So there's nothing, there's no formula for life. No one should tell you at 20, you need to get this at what, you need to. There's no real formula. The formula is you follow what you really are uh, passionate about, follow your guts. If at first you don't succeed, try and try and try again. In life, generally, I have uh, my sister guides me, Leah. She's very, she's a lawyer and she knows when to tell me this is crap, you need to stop ABCD. And uh, I have a close personal friend who I can't mention, but <laughs> Anna Jijua. <laughs> they are in business, they guide me through business, they guide me through life. We've known each other for like um, 14 to 15 years. And I think it's good to have mentors. Different. They are all different ages actually. You can see like Alice Wahome is not exactly my peer, Gladys Wahome, my sister is just like uh, four years older than me. So I think you just need to get like different people in different places. Mm -hmm.